a queen knows how to build her empire with the same stones that were thrown at her. Greetings, I am Raven Franklin, the 91st Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And I want to thank you all for taking this time out of your day to attend this year's Women History Month program. Women's Month is so important and God made women in his image for a special reason. God is with women. And even in the most difficult of times, he is there to support us and bring us strength for a new day. This month is our month to be recognized and appreciated for so much that we are not given credit for. Women, let's stand strong and never forget how important we are. Fight for what you believe in and never go speechless. I know I am not the only one that is super excited to hear Ms. Linda Johnson Rice speak. So at this time, I would like to turn the program over to Chancellor Alexander. Then I will be back with the bio of our speaker and the next voice you will hear will be the wonderful Ms. Linda Johnson Rice. And at any point in the program, if you have a question for Ms. Johnson, please leave it in the Q&A box. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to our Women's, Women's History Month celebration at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. It is indeed a pleasure to extend our sincere appreciation to each of you for taking a moment to join us. Women's History Month is a time for us to recognize and salute women's contributions to the American family and to society. Women have been making these contributions since the beginning of time. They continue to strengthen the family and enrich our lives with intellectual gifts, creative talents, and an indomitable spirit in business, government, philanthropy, religion, education, health, the military, sports, the arts, and many, many others. Therefore, we pay tribute and celebrate women of all backgrounds and cultures during this special occasion. We're pleased to have former CEO of Johnson Publishing Company, Mrs. Linda Johnson Rice, as our keynote speaker. As the youngest and first African-American woman CEO among the top five of the Black Enterprise 100 largest Black-owned companies, Mrs. Johnson Rice has been a ray of positivity on the black community with her strong and resilient leadership. She continues to bring diverse and dynamic viewpoints to the business community through her extensive leadership experience. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Rice, for taking out the time to be with us on this evening. We extend to you a roaring golden lion welcome. We look forward to hearing you speak as you offer your words of inspiration and wisdom to our community. Once again, we thank each of you for attending this delightful occasion as we recognize and celebrate our women. We hope that you enjoyed the program and that your experience is golden. Thank you. I have the honor of introducing today's outstanding speaker, Ms. Linda Johnson Rice. She is the former CEO of Johnson Publishing Company, where she became the first African-American woman CEO among the top five of the Black Enterprise 100's largest Black-owned companies. Linda Johnson Rice has shown a ray of positivity on the Black community with her strong and resilient leadership. Today, Johnson Rice continues to bring diverse and dynamic viewpoints to the business community through her extensive board experience. As president of the Chicago Public Library Board of Directors, she has significantly streamlined processes as well as brought a hands-on community approach to the board. Linda also serves on the board of directors of Omnicrom Group, Grubhub, and Innova and is also a council member 
of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture and Northwestern Memorial Corporation and a trustee at the Art Institute of Chicago. Please help me in welcoming the amazing Linda Johnson. Let us all get ready to hear Miss Amazing Linda Johnson. You're muted, Miss Linda. Am I unmuted now? Let's see. Yes, you are. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Listen, technology obviously is not my strong suit. <laughs> But I, I did want to say, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's really quite a thrill. Um, I, I would stop and say that Arkansas really does hold a special place in my heart because this is my father's home state. Um, my dad was born in Arkansas City, Arkansas, which I had, have had the pleasure of visiting on several occasions and was welcomed with open arms. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I, I am honored that you've invited me to share my thoughts on black women gaining power through purpose, power through purpose during Women's History Month. I like to think of this commemorative event as a time to learn something new about powerful women who've made history and how they inspire us to remain resilient and hopeful in face of adversity. Even when women have been denied equal rights, equal access, and equal justice, they found ways to wield influence. For our purposes today and this evening, let's call it sway. Sway can be powerful or gentle. A seismic sway can start a movement like we saw in 2017 when hashtag MeToo went viral or it can be a steady rhythmic drumbeat that over time gains velocity to affect lasting change. But it has to start somewhere. And a lot of times it starts with one person. And the objective, of course, as beautifully stated by the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is to fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Purpose is a powerful motivator. Purpose is internal fulfillment achieved through outward actions. Okay, I wanna repeat that one more time. Purpose is internal fulfillment achieved through outward actions. I was raised by two people who embodied that philosophy. I'll, I'll give you an example. We know from our experiences that when we tell our own stories, they sound a lot different than when someone else tells them. That was the purpose behind Johnson Publishing Company and the legacy magazines, Ebony and Jet, that my parents, John H. and Eunice W. Johnson founded in the late 1940s and 50s to amplify black voices, to tell stories that reflect our reality, the way we see ourselves. That same thing can be said about women. Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to Congress and the first to run for president on a major party ticket said, the emotional, sexual and psychological stereotyping of females begins when the doctor says it's a girl. Bigotry and inequality are manifestations of sight, ignorance, stereotypes, rumors and outright lies that influence people's opinions about who we are. Racial and gender bias and discrimination are themselves resilient, making it necessary for us to fight some of the same battles over and over again. All women face many of the same challenges in the struggle for equality. But today I want to focus on black women. 
because their challenges are intensified because of who they are. For some people, the skin they're in is all the criteria they need to form a negative opinion. The conversation about black women is different because our pain is different. Our history of suffering and mistreatment, degradation and denigration is different. Not being recognized as mothers or as bright promising students or as future CEOs or at times even as women. That denigration has been repeated over and over in an attempt to discount black women's opinions and pain and to silence their voices. The novelist and scholar Ralph Ellison described that feeling of being unseen and generalized based on stereotypes rather than the actual person in his novel, Invisible Man. But Sojourner Truth did it in four words in 1851, speaking before a women's rights convention when she posed this rhetorical question four times during her historic speech, ain't I a woman, ain't I a woman? Her emphasis was on the fight for equal rights for black women who feel invisible too, even within the movements they've helped start and dedicated themselves to mind, body, and soul. And throughout history, that invisibility has been felt by black women in the fight for women's rights, which has had many names, women's suffrage, women's lib, the feminist movement, hashtag me too. And yet some black women have expressed that they felt muted within these movements because they have fallen short of reflecting their concerns. Shirley Chisholm proudly identified as a feminist, but she was also critical at times of the feminist agenda. In a 1974 interview for a feminist magazine called Off Our Backs, she expounded on a critique of the feminist movement, the feminist movement that she'd previously made at a black feminist conference. She said, we're not interested in whether or not they call us Ms. That's just another label. That's not one of the things on our agenda. The minority woman has a different set of priorities for many of the women in the women's movement who are regarded as the leadership in the liberation movement. Minority women have some definite concerns and we're wondering whether or not white women, particularly middle and upper class white women really understand what it means to be black and female or Indian and female or Puerto Rican or Chicano and female at the same time. Shirley Chisholm put into context the duality black women inherit of being black and female, of separating their power to be fearless in pursuit of purpose and frightened at the same time of accepting the risks without the rewards. In this way, Black women have had to fight against having their voices silenced by the noise around them, with so much pain preceding them and turmoil that was happening right in the middle of their purposeful moments. Black women's struggles are different. Take Fannie Lou Hamer. Before she became a civil rights and political activist, she went to a doctor to have a cyst removed. He performed a hysterectomy on her instead without her consent. This took place before she'd had any children of her own. Imagine that basic human right being stolen from you. There was a time in the deep South when sterilization of black women was a common practice to reduce the black population. It happened so frequently it earned the nickname Mississippi appendectomy. Please let that sink in. A year later, Hamer was fat, fired from her job for attempting to register to vote and her employer stripped her and her husband of their land. They had to start from scratch. But within those struggles, Fannie Lou Hamer found her purpose and she put her whole body into fighting for voting rights and racial equality. She didn't want to be brutally beaten by the police 
and sustained lifelong injuries for sitting in an all white section of a bus station. She didn't want to be shot at for trying to register voters, but she wasn't deterred. She kept it up and would not allow herself to be silenced. She traveled around the country giving powerful speeches and eventually helped found the National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. She fulfilled her purpose and gained power, but it cost her more than any human being should have had to pay. Imagine what Fannie Lou Hamer could have done with a camera phone and a Twitter account. We're fortunate to live in this digital age. I realize social media has its pros and cons. One of the positives that has come out of social media is that you don't have to wait for someone to give you credit or to tell your story. You can do that yourself and present the images you want people to see. You have the power to counter the narrative. Today, it's still necessary to counter the narratives we've been told about women in history whose reputations and lives were destroyed because they wouldn't give up the fight. Think of how long jazz singer Billie Holiday's narrative has been focused on her drug use and abusive relationships. Only now to see her portrayal in the dynamic film, The United States versus Billie Holiday as unflappable, even under the threat of losing her freedom in her quest to shine a spotlight on the lynching of African-Americans, which she so graphically described in the song, Strange Fruit. Hollywood sometimes takes creative license, but that part of the film was absolutely accurate. There are a lot of women we should be celebrating this month who may not have gotten the credit they deserve for their leadership, their ideas and solutions. Like Tarana Burke, who founded the Me Too movement in 2006 to raise awareness of sexual abuse, rape and assault on women. When I think of Tarana Burke, I'm reminded of the incomparable civil rights and women's rights activist, Dr. Dorothy Height. Dr. Height said, if you worry about who's going to get credit, you don't get much work done. Dr. Height was a powerhouse who fought against illiteracy and unemployment, but she also believed women and African-Americans faced a common struggle that should be considered as a whole. Now we fast forward to Tarana Burke, a civil rights activist and a victim of sex abuse, founded the movement that has become modern day feminism's watershed moment. Now when a woman bravely comes forward to expose a pain so personal, she inherits a posse, a posse to back her up. Me Too gained traction when actresses in Hollywood began speaking out and turned it into a hashtag worthy cause but arguably it hasn't benefited black women to the same extent. Dr. Height also said, a Negro woman has the same kind of problems as other women. However, she acknowledged, but she can't take the same things for granted. Dr. Height used her considerable sway to fight for racial and gender equality. She organized and partnered with integrated coalitions and mainstream organizations like the YWCA to support women's basic needs around family and childcare. She lived to be almost a hundred years old. And while she certainly gained power through purpose, receiving multiple awards from four US presidents, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and earning 36 honorary doctorate degrees. She never saw her concept of bundling civil rights and women's rights fully realized in her lifetime. But we realize that now through Tarana Burke. You know, when we look at women's history, it should reassure us that others have faced similar headwinds valiantly and survived and that we can too. And hopefully with each generation, women's circumstances have gotten better. But as I mentioned, 
Some battles that have been won are again being fought. Sadly, one of those is voter rights. Which brings me to another modern day shero, Stacey Abrams. Whether or not you agree with her politics, you must admire her tenacity. After losing the governor's race in 2018, she got to work on voting rights and voter protections, getting people registered. And it made a difference. It made a whopping difference. Stacey Abrams gained power through purpose. She had her sway. She rocked the state of Georgia back and forth until she turned it over. History provided her with examples of women who gained power by fulfilling their purpose with a similarly rhythmic, one day at a time type of determination. When I think of Stacey Abrams, I'm reminded of Barbara Jordan, the first African-American elected to Congress from the Deep South. She lost two elections for the state house in Texas prior to that, but redistricting helped her win landslide victories in both the primary and the general elections to become the first African-American elected to that chamber. But later in Congress, she was criticized by African-Americans and women for refusing to attach herself fully to any one organization's agenda. Why? Because she didn't want to be bound to an agenda that she had little control over or that could impinge her ability to sway the institutional power structure she needed to win over to move her agenda forward. Sway isn't just about motion and causing a shift. Ultimately, the goal of having sway is to have control or at least some semblance of control. Congresswoman Barbara Jordan understood that and she refused to relinquish control to fit in or to keep people from talking about her behind her back. Because guess what? They were going to do that anyway, so it didn't matter. You know, when we worry about what people think about us, it feeds into that mindset of imposter syndrome. It's, it's noise in your head telling you that you're not good enough. When people are successful at making you feel as though you don't belong, it may be tempting to conform or try to meet their expectations. But when you do that, you place limitations on yourself and you extinguish your power. There's nothing wrong with living up to expectations, but there's a lot wrong with becoming someone you're not because of them. That's where you have to draw the line. My Angelou said, if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. If being amazing at something fulfills your purpose, then do it, do it. Purpose is an internal fulfillment, it's personal. And you know what, it, it changes. So you might as well make up your mind right now that you're going to be open to it because it's inevitable. Think about what your life trajectory could be. Dollars to donuts, it's a long game. But to the students, try not to get wrapped up in the pressure of feeling like you must know exactly what your purpose is the minute you graduate. Your purpose will evolve over time. Take my mother. I love this example. I love her, of course, Eunice W. Johnson. She earned a master's degree in social work, but through life's twists and turns, she ended up making an indelible mark on the high fashion industry through the Ebony Fashion Fair. She was the first black woman to buy couture, one of a kind designs and showcase those ensembles on black models. And let me tell you, they were fabulous, like works of art. 
She put them on black models of every hue and the Ebony Fashion Fair became a launching pad for black designers and black models. So much so that Italian designer Emilio Pucci was one of the first European designers to hire a black model. Where did he find this model? He asked my mother. And because fashion is all about trends, once one of the leading designers crossed the color line, others followed, like Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, Valentino, and Dior. From social work to magazines to the fashion and beauty business, talk about an evolution. My parents founded Johnson Publishing Company together, but both made their own separate contributions to the world. That brings me to another Johnson, Sheila Johnson, though no relation, the CEO of Salamander Resorts and Spas. She has received the prestigious Forbes Travel Guide five-star rating. She also owns a stake in not one, not two, but three professional sports teams, the WNBA's Washington Mystics, the NBA's Washington Wizards, and the NHL Capitals. Sheila Johnson is someone every young woman at the University of Arkansas should know about. She started building wealth in 1979 as co-founder of Black Entertainment Television or BET as we know it. And when BET was sold, she reaped the financial benefits of all the work she had put into that business. Then she decided to go in a brand new direction that fulfilled her purpose, a completely different business, the hospitality industry. Even following her success with BET, no bank would loan her the money to open her hotel. She had to use her own and she came out on top. She also owns a golf resort near Tampa, Florida, which hosts the annual PGA Tour Championship. And she started a management company that oversees three additional resort properties in Florida, South Carolina, and Jamaica. She hosts a film festival and even produced the critically acclaimed movie, The Butler. I think Sheila's found her purpose, her own fulfillment. She is a woman who forged paths in arenas that were male dominated and gained power. And words matter. Women who are having their sway in media and in creative spaces like no other time in history. What Oprah started, women like journalists and talk show hosts Tamron Hall and Angela Rye have continued. And we can add Elaine Welteroth to that group. A co-host of The Talk TV show, Elaine started in the magazine business as an unpaid intern at Ebony. I love that. She was later promoted to assistant beauty and style editor before going on to become editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. Recently on The Talk, Welteroth, who's 34, shared how she became, first became acquainted with activist and poet laureate Amanda Gorman when Gorman was named one of Teen Vogue's 21 Under 21. Welteroth said she knew then that she was looking at Black history in the making. I personally will never forget Amanda Gorman at age 22 performing her stunning poem at the Biden inauguration with her mastery of words, confidence, and delicate hand gestures. Amanda Gorman has created an identity for herself at a young age and a wonderful future awaits her, whichever way it evolves. I believe that history already recognizes the stunning achievements of this generation, your generation, of brilliant young women to which many of you belong. Some of them, I'm sure, were told their dreams were too big, told to wait, that it wasn't their turn. And thankfully, thank God they didn't listen. Young women like Tina Wells, the author and marketing maven who had the audacity to start her first business when she was only 16 years old. And let me tell you, she wasn't representing the local ice cream stand either. 
she started her business with clients such as Dell Computers, OWN, Apple, and Johnson & Johnson, to name a few. Now she's helping other people launch their dream businesses. As a matter of fact, a Google search of Tina Wells puts her in the same search category as Oprah, Sheila Johnson, Shonda Rhimes, and Radio One founder, Kathy Hughes. And Wells is just 41 years old. Each of these bright businesswomen and creatives all come from different backgrounds. But when their moment came, they seized it. You can feel as though you know exactly what your purpose is, but if you don't do anything to fulfill it, you will never gain power from it. Sometimes you've got to pull up anchor and just start sailing. Having your sway is gaining and maintaining control. That's not always possible. That's not always possible when the thing you're trying to control is outside of you, but you can certainly control what happens in your own life. Take it from Michelle Obama. She knows. She said, success is only meaningful and enjoyable if it feels like it's your own. And remember, whatever your purpose, if you've given it all you've got, but it's just not working out for you, what you put into it wasn't a waste of time. You'll still be able to draw from that experience when or if those circumstances arise. If not you, then perhaps someone else will benefit from your experience. After all, we might not have had our first woman and first woman of color, Vice President Kamala Harris, if Shirley Chisholm and former Senator and U.S. Ambassador Carol Mosley Braun hadn't run for president. For Black women, equality has always been a double-edged sword. But through history, Black women have marched for civil rights and for women's rights. Every woman who has gained power through purpose has lit the path, put up signs and signals for the next generation of all women, because ultimately that is the perfect posse. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to speak with you. I'm happy to answer any questions. I think we might have a few out there. Yes, thank you so much, Ms. Linda. So at this time, if anyone has not had a chance to get their questions in, please put them down below in the Q&A box and I will read them out for Ms. Linda to answer. And I ask that you say your name, um, your major, and um, your classification in your question. So we'll just give it a few seconds to see. Sure. Absolutely. I'm delighted to speak to all of you. This is really great. It's inspiring for me. Okay, we have a few questions trickling in. Good. <laughs> First question is from Alexandria Slater. She is a junior and a human science education major. Her question is, what do you think we as Black women should do to continue breaking barriers for the years to come? You know, I think one of the things that obviously that I just talked about um, is you, you have to figure out what your purpose is. And we know that that is gonna change and evolve over time. But as you figure that out, be sure to reach back and take someone along with you. As you achieve success, momentum in your career, in your life, I think it's so important, which is why I love talking to students. I think it's so important that you inspire someone else. And so that just creates a great momentum. And, um, and so I think that's really one of the things that, that's most important. 
And so, you know, and as a black woman, you know, you really need to be um, confident in who you are. And that's not always easy. That's not always easy. We all feel insecure at times. We all do. I, I, I have to confess for sure. Absolutely, I have on many occasions. But feel confident about who you are and what you have to offer, not only yourself, but what you have to offer the world. Thank you. Um, next question we have is from Kamara Hanley. She is a, is a junior biology major. And her question is, now that Kamala Harris is now elected as the first African Asian American woman vice president, do you think the fight for gender equality will change more over the next few years? I would like to be hopeful and say yes. Yes, I try to lead with positivity. So I think this is obviously a tremendous step. And, and, you know, it's one that's been obviously long in the making because, you know, she is rising off the shoulders of so many other women who have fought battles, some that we know, some that we don't know. But um, I, I would like to believe and want to believe that we are at least moving forward here. These are, these are major steps. And I'm so... Um, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of Kamala Harris and what she's accomplished throughout her career and now to be vice president. And who knows, you know, after vice president, what's next? Oh, I think you're on mute. Great. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. I know this technology is fun. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> um, I think we are going to let some of the panel panelists actually ask their own question. Um, I think Kevin Crompton has a question. Would you like to say yours, Kevin? Sure, Raven. I don't mind. I don't mind asking my question. Good evening, Dr. Rice. My name is Kevin Crumpton Jr. I am a junior at the University of Arkansas at Palm Bluff, majoring in chemistry pre-med. And I did a little bit of research on you um, prior to um, this, this meeting. And so I wanna ask you, how did it feel for you to be a recipient of the BET Honors Media Award? I think you received it, I wanna say in, in 2009. I or did. 2000, yes, ma'am, 2009. So I just wanna know, all of the emotions that you felt being a recipient of, su of such a prestigious award? Well, you know, it, it was an incredible experience, I have to tell you, because I've grown up obviously with BET and respect it so tremendously and what Sheila Johnson and Bob Johnson built together. And obviously being part of black media, that was what meant so much to me. And so to be able to receive that award from, you know, from my peers, from my own and from, from friends. And it just showed me that they had been watching me and that they appreciate and appreciated what I'd been doing and how hard I'd been working. And they, they understood that. And so that acknowledgement meant so much to me. I mean, I, I have that award. I, pr I proudly display that because to me, it's, it's one of the more beautiful and more touching and more, um, I don't know, it just, me. It, you know, it got, it went to my soul. It went to my soul. So I love that you asked me that because uh, it, 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 it means a lot to me. Thank you. The next question we have is from Miss Angelica. She is majoring in elementary education. And her question is, how do you deal with so many high expectations on yourself from others while you're trying not to be overwhelmed? Oh, that's a really good question. You know what? I think you have to take time for yourself. I really do. I, I, firmly believe in that. And what, and that can manifest itself in, in many ways. I mean, it, it can be just, you know, going for a walk or, or just being able to be centered. You know, I, I tell you when things were so difficult at Johnson Publishing Company, I 
would just go to, I love art. And so I would go to the Art Institute and I would just walk through the galleries quietly by myself in order to just sort of clear the noise that was in my head. And so, you know, I had the great opportunity to do that. And, and it just depends on where you are and what your circumstances are, but you've got to take that time for yourself, just to quiet for yourself. Because otherwise, if, you're, if you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be good for anyone else. That's for sure. That is for sure. So that's most important. Thank you. Next question we have is from Mr. Henry Brooks. Ida B. Wells is a hero of mine. She was brilliant and fearless. How do we encourage young women to find their voice? Well, hopefully, hopefully I'm doing that. But I think um, having people, listening to people, having people speak, being encouraged, and, and, and it, it, if, if you can just take one kernel away that encourages you from what you've heard today or from any speaker, that is what keeps you going. I mean, I think those are things that, that you really have to, to, to listen to people that you respect and also um, try, and you know, you're, you're young, you all are young, you're sponges, absorb everything you possibly can, read what you can, listen to people talk, all these different things will give you ideas and be, I think, inspirations for you. Yeah, Ida B. Wells was an incredible, incredible person. Absolutely. Thank you. It looks like we've reached the end of our questions, but I would like to give just a few more minutes just to see if anyone thinks of something maybe that they would like to ask, sure. just literally like one minute. <laughs> Um, and then we will move on. I'm going to have to make my next trip down to Pine Bluff. <laughs> I've been yeah. to Little Rock. I've been to Fayetteville. <laughs> I've spoken in Fayetteville. Now I got to come to Pine Bluff. <laughs> we would love for you to come. <laughs> I, would, I would love it. I would love it. <laughs> so um, I think Miss Alexandria Slater says that she has a question. So at this time, Alex, you may ask your question. Um, Alex, you're muted. Okay, um, as a female leader, what was probably the most difficult thing you've done in your life? Oh my, there's been um, many things, but I think one of the hardest things was coming to the realization that um, I had to sell Ebony and Jet. And it really was it's systemic. It was really what was happening in the media business and in the publishing business more specifically. And it became um, really, it got to the point where it, it, the, the, financial, the financial picture just didn't make sense. And I think you've got, when those things happen and when you hit those crossroads like that, you really have to take a step back and make very logical sound decisions. And it was very difficult for me because not only was it a business, but this was my life. I mean, I'd grown up in this business. And so that was one of the most difficult decisions I, I ever had to make. But, um, but I have to tell you, you have to make them. You're gonna be faced with these tough decisions all the time, all the time. But um, you, know, you try to take as much emotion as you can out of it. For me, that was really hard. That was extremely difficult to do. But, um, but I did, and I, I had to make those decisions and, I, and, and you have to make them and you have to be able to move on and move forward. And right now, actually, um, Johnson Publishing Company, I'm not the former CEO, I am the CEO of Johnson Publishing Company. And Johnson Publishing Company is moving in a little bit different direction because we are still in the media business, but we're in the film and television business. So it was just announced last week that I'm executive producing a documentary called The Empire of Ebony, 
which we'll talk about and will show the seven decades of what Johnson Publishing Company and Ebony Magazine have built. As a matter of fact, the film crew is in town um, this week in Chicago uh, filming. So that's very exciting. And I'm executive producing a, docu a docu-series um, based on uh, Lerone Bennett's book, Before the Mayflower, who was our executive editor. So we have a lot of things that are still going on with Johnson Publishing that are really very exciting. So it's almost like JPC 2.0. So, but the thing is, I had to find my path there and I had to find my purpose and, and realize that um, what was done in the past is brilliant and incredible. And, but there's a way to springboard off of that and move it even forward into the future. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Absolutely. Wow, this has been great and I have, Truly been touched by your words of wisdom and thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, I believe we covered everyone. Oh, well, no, I think I missed one. <laughs> I saw one just pop up. Let me see. Oh, we have one more question from oh. Courtney Jackson. It says, where do you see Ebony in 50 years? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Um, well, Ebony and Jet now have new ownership and I'm so excited for them. I really am. And so they are very much pushing the digital space. And so whatever that looks like 50 years from now, all I can say is I want Ebony to be as relevant 50 years from now as it is today. Great, thank you. Now I think we've answered all the questions. So on behalf, oh, did someone say something? No, I did, I just said terrific. Oh. Okay, um, on behalf of the university and student involvement and leadership, we thank you, Ms. Linda, for those powerful words of encouragement to all us women. Let us all remember to always fight for what you believe in but do it in a way that helps others and strive to be a better woman day by day. Thank you all so much for attending and have a great night. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>